Um, we're in the life and times of um, Jacob. Um, when I was a kid, I don't know if it's... When I was in college, the, I don't know what the attraction was, but there was a lot of people that loved to watch soap operas. And uh, during the day and, and everything, this is the, this, these are guys watching soap operas. I was going, wow, this is interesting. But, uh, you know, we're, we're always drawn to drama. Um, it seems like that if there's, you know, pe people are fascinated with, with other people's lives. You know, it's, it seems that way. We, uh, maybe some of you have been watching, I don't know the latest on the uh, flight that vanished, but I think they found a window. Uh, they didn't find a window. Uh, they thought they had found a window, okay? They thought they had found a window of the plane that vanished. You know, the Malaysian flight, you know, you know what I'm talking about? No. Uh, some of you do, some of you don't know. Well, I guess a couple days ago, three, four days ago, three days ago? Just yesterday? Wow, it seems like it was in the news a long time. Okay. Uh, yesterday, a 777, 777 airplane with 230 some people on board or somewhere around that number vanished. Vanished. They, don't, they, they, they have not found any wreckage. They have not found uh, a, any, any idea. They did, they did say that there were two people that got on the plane that had fake passports. That, that's all they have said right now. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, a lot of times it's, it's a, we're fascinated when things bring drama into our life. And, and I think that people are following this. I know that the people, of course, it's a, it's a terrible thing for the people who have loved ones and family and co-workers and friends on that airplane because they have no idea what's going on. And they, they, they're, they're, we always assume the worst, don't we? It, it, I think it's a tendency of the human heart to assume what is worst. Uh, it's hard to assume what's best. It's hard as we sang, I believe we sang tonight, uh, and I might, I might go and, and, and repeat some of these words later on in my sermon. Uh, we sang, have faith in God. He's on his throne, you know, in, in all of these things. And so, uh, regardless of the drama in our life, God's still on his throne. God is still carrying out his purposes in ways that we can't understand quite. But, um, and, and if you look back on the, the drama of Jacob, Jacob, Jacob's really a drama story. Because all the way back in Genesis 25, verses 12 and 14, we saw that God had given a, re a revelation to Rebekah, Jacob's mother, about her twin sons, Esau and Jacob, especially about Jacob's role. And we saw in the story that uh, Jacob is gaining the birthright of Esau. He gained the birthright of Esau, and especially the prophecy that the, the, the older, the younger will serve, the older will serve the younger. Uh, then we, we found in Genesis chapter 27 that Isaac was going to do everything he could to keep the, the, the promise of God from coming true. He, he wanted Esau uh, to be blessed. He loved Esau, um, just as Abraham loved Ishmael. And even as Abraham had asked the Lord to bless Ishmael, so Isaac wanted the Lord to bless Esau. In fact, he intended to thwart God's direct command as revealed by that uh, passage there. And yet God's decree, decree, God's decree triumphed. God's will triumphed. And Jacob did receive the blessing, but in the process of receiving the blessing, uh, Rebekah, his mother, and Jacob uh, were actually deceptive in what they were doing, weren't they? Uh, even, even though God's will prevailed, um, they, did, they did so by these human agents who were scheming. And as we said, when we study the passage, everybody comes out looking bad in that story. It's, it's not a great story. Uh, everybody comes about looking bad. And if it had been today, it would probably be on the... the there's all these, these shows, gossip shows and things like that about what's going on. People haven't been talking about this family for years. It's like the Kardashians, I guess. You know, Jacob's family is like the Kardashians. And, 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 and they'd been talking about it. The problem back then is that if you didn't live around people, you didn't really know what was going on because you didn't have telephones or TVs or, or any of that stuff. But, but here's drama. And then you get to chapter 27. Um, and for the most part, the, the consequences for these actions have been pushed aside. We, we, don't, we don't see a lot of the consequences. And then chapter 28, verses 1 through 9, we see, we see Isaac freely blessing Jacob. I mean, um, we thought that maybe Isaac would, would say, well, no, no, you got this deceitfully, and so I'm going to do 
and bless Esau. But instead, he blesses freely Jacob. And, and, and maybe he found out, we said, that he was rebelling from God's will because he knew that God had promised the blessing to the younger. And then in 28, we see that, that salvation is really about what God does first, then our response to that. And, uh, but we, we, we get a sense here that what, why isn't Jacob being punished? I mean, he, he goes out and, and, and he finds in chapter 29, where we, we, we talked about last week, we, he goes out, he, he finds the girl of his dreams, so to speak. They kiss before the first date, you know? They're making out before the first date, so to speak. And, and we, see, we see everything going well. I mean, he, he's not killed by his brother. He's protected God blesses him. He, in fact, in an oracle from God, the promises of the, the, the covenant are reiterated to him. And here's a person who we think should get his just desserts, not getting his just desserts. That's why, that's why I label the sermon tonight, when the chickens come home to roost. You know, you know what that means? That eventually, what you do, in contrary to God's moral commands, are going to come home and hurt you. Because we can't break, someone says, well, we break God's law. Well, really, we can't ultimately break God's law because they eventually break us. Societies that do not obey God's laws eventually are what? Destroyed. Because societies can't exist without a moral fiber. And the moral fiber for all societies comes from the scriptures and from God's holy rules. And so... Um, we read in, in 13 through 20, which we're going to start with tonight in, 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 in our passage tonight. Um, excuse me, no, we, we didn't do that. I have paper up here. Um, in 13 through 20, we, we see that, that Laban is now being introduced. They're being introduced to each other. He, he, he meets the girl of his dreams. And now he's... Laban is starting to craft a deceptive tale or, or twist to all that is going on. And so we're going to see that Jacob is going, the chickens are going to come home to roost in his relationship with Laban, his uncle. And so as we read this, I want you to understand that there's a drama of, of, of salvation that is going on here for someone who doesn't deserve it. Just like you and me, there is a drama going on here. I would, let, let's start reading in verse 21 of Genesis chapter 29. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I might go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the coming evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban, Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I, serve, did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not done in our country to give the younger daughter before the firstborn. Complete, uh, complete the week uh, of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave, his daughter, gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife, and Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to, to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also and loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. Verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord looked uh, upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Sim uh, Simeon. Uh, and again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my seven son, excuse me, not my son, my husband will be attracted to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name will be called Levi. And she conceived and bore again, bore again a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that as we, we look at this tonight, I pray that you would encourage our hearts, Father, that, um, 
you would just help us, Father, to, to realize uh, the, the things that you're working out in our lives and how you parent us, how you change us, how you um, make us into the image of Christ. Father, I pray that we would see that you're working always in every single thing, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, on the side of every scene, that um, in the drama and the stories of the scriptures, they reveal to us your, your handiwork. And Father, I pray that we would realize that we are also your handiwork, those who believe in you. And Father, I pray that you would help us and encourage us tonight with this truth. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what divine parenting is? You've heard of divine parenting. You get the idea of divine parenting, right? God is like a parent in many, many ways. We call him father. And we see God's tough love here in chastening and disciplining uh, Jacob. Uh, I'm sure you've been wondering, as I said before, uh, Lord, when are you going to get around to dealing with Jacob? Jacob does not seem to be a godly man. He does not seem to be a man that you would choose to be representative of your kingdom. Uh, you know, he had to be, yes, exiled to a land, not his home. But God protected him every step of the way. God had blessed him by his father's mouth. He had blessed him, I said, again, by his own mouth. And he had given him a beautiful woman uh, who adores him to be his wife. And then you ask the question, God, when are you going to get around to do some character crafting? You know, character crafting. This man needs to be changed. And we're going to see an example of God's divine parenting here. God, God is our, our divine parent and he, he loves us so much that he will not let us go. And I, I think that's an encouragement for you. That God loves you so much that he's not going to let how wicked our hearts are, how, how, how rebellious our actions are, to lead us in a way that he does not have some sort of providential discipline for us in our lives. Um, see, the Lord loves his children. If he loves his children, what does the Bible say? He what? Disciplines them, doesn't he? You know, you know your mom and dad love you when they discipline you. When they say, no, you can't do that. We, we tend to say that about the dog these days. No. No. Because the dog likes to get in everything. The children like to do that too. And of course, the first word every child learns is no, many times, because we're, we're trying to set down rules and we're, we're disciplining them because we love them. You don't want, in other words, when you tell your, your, your child not to put his hand on a hot stove, you're not trying to take something fun away from him, are you? You're trying to protect him, right? And that, that's what parents do. They, they protect their children by saying, I don't want you to go through what I did. But you know, sometimes kids have to go through some things. Sometimes we go through some things and, and we have to understand that. And I, I want you to see four things, four things in this passage. There are four ideas in this passage about biblical or divine parenting. Number one, God lets us live with the consequences of our own action. There are consequences. And we're saying here, where are the consequences for Jacob? I want you to look at verses 21 through 30. Um, God saddles Jacob with a complicated family life. I want you to see that in this passage. The Lord is going to give Jacob some consequences, which he is going to have to live for, with for all of his life. He will never be able to get away from the consequences that the Lord is going to give him. They're literally going to be around him all his life. And the Lord does this because he loves Jacob. You know, we, we ask, Lord, why don't you... It's, it's the same thing with Paul. Remember Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, where he said, Lord, take this thorn away from me. And for Paul, it was what? His sickness. It was his health. And, and, and he, would, he would want this sickness taken away from him. But because the Lord loved him, the Lord didn't. Now, what, what, did, what did Paul eventually say? 
My grace is sufficient for me, right? And sometimes we have to learn grace. We have to learn really to abandon our dependence on God's grace. And, and sometimes we don't do that unless the Lord allows the consequences for our sins to shape our lives. You all are shaped by myriads of consequences, myriads of actions, not only by yourself but by other people towards you, aren't you? And so God allows, and he, he does that. He, he lets us live with the consequences of our own actions. Um, and the, even though the Lord is going to use the deception of Laban, the Lord's ultimate plan is to craft a character of Jacob. And we learn in this passage uh, that God models his own, that he models in Jacob and what he does with Jacob, what he does with us. And that's the first principle. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He, he allows, and the way he disciplines sometimes, he allows the consequences of our own actions to stay with us a lifetime. I'm, I'm reminded. Uh, of course, I've always been, a, as you know, a big sports fan. And, and, and one of the things when you watch basketball, it seems like everybody uh, has tattoos, you know, on their arms and everything. And, you know, uh, but that lasts a lifetime. I know people who've gotten girlfriends, names written on their arms, and they, they no longer are dating the girlfriend. Uh, and, and that lasts a lifetime. I know there's a way to get it off, but, but, but it's painful from what I understand. It's really, it really hurts. In fact, it hurts to get the tattoo, doesn't it? And, and Jacob here is going to have to learn some things. You knew it was coming. And Jacob had fallen in love with Rachel and he, he had been promised Rachel as his wife. And the day came for him to marry Rachel and there was a feast given. And, and he, he goes in and he lays with his wife and all of a sudden he wakes up in the morning and finds out what? He's been deceived. He's been deceived. And Jacob just had been bumped into the first and greatest consequence of his own personality. The deceiver deceived himself. Sometimes what we're good at in rebelling against God is God allows someone else to come in all, uh, into our lives and allows us to experience what we have been doing to other people. And that happens, you know that. That, that our, our rebellious nature or our, the consequences that we have chosen, sometimes God allows other people because sometimes we have to feel and experience the, the pain of sin? There is a pain of rebellion against God. A lot of times people say, oh, it doesn't matter. I can, I can just do what I ever want to. And, and it, you know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, there's no consequences. There's no consequences. Yes, there are. There will be. And there will be here on earth and there will be there in the judgment seat of God. And so that's what, that's what he's done here. He's, he's, he, he, he didn't want Leah Leah apparently really loved Jacob. Uh, the more you know Leah, the more you like her. And you just wonder, how in the world she, could she like a guy like Jacob? And you really do feel some pity for her. But the first thing, God allows the consequences of her actions to last a lifetime. Many times. Secondly, God doesn't soften the consequences of sin. He doesn't do that. He, you know, as parents... Um, and I, I just want you to think about this. Um, we don't want our kids to suffer, do we? We don't want anybody really to suffer. We're, we're always trying to say, uh, we, we, we don't want you to suffer. And so many times we, what's a word, ameliorate? ameliorate? Is that a word? Uh, um, uh, we, we put a cushion under them. Um, when, when I was at uh, my freshman year, at Texas A&M, uh, I lived in a dorm, and there were th about 30 of us guys in the dorm, and we all, it was a great dorm. Oh, it was wonderful. We called it the Hilton. It really wasn't the Hilton. Uh, it didn't look anything like a Hilton. Didn't have room service. And before I got there that semester, it had one phone in the middle of the hallway for 30 guys, okay? Before I got there, it had no air conditioning. And I can tell you, in Texas, it gets hot. 
But they put in a phone in every room and they put in uh, a wall unit air conditioner. So they raised the price of the room and they got more money out of us. But, but it was a great dorm to live in because we, we got to really know people. But, but I, I, met a, I met a guy, he, he lived around the area that I uh, grew up in. And, and my, my dad was, was a very stickler. He said, the moment you get your first moving violation, you don't have a car. This guy was 18 years old. He was on his fourth car. The other three he had wrecked. And it was all his fault. Now, there's no one over there. Yeah. They're all his fault. I just looked over here. <laughs> They're all his fault. And, and it's tendency of parents to do things like that, to, to soften the blow. But that's not God's consistent pattern because God himself loves us and he lets us live with the consequences of our sins and he doesn't always soften it even though we might want to say, Lord, Lord, if I can get out of this situation, please help me. Sometimes he says no. He doesn't soften the blow. He allows you to experience that consequence and he allows you to do that because he doesn't soften the blow but because he loves us. That's a loving thing. You know, a lot of times we want a God that... Um, we want a God that um, meets our every need. So if, if we don't want to go through difficulty in life, we want a God that just takes that all away, don't we? And there are plenty of people who will give you a God like that. The problem is, that's not the God of the Bible. It's not the God that Jacob is serving. It's not the God that Jacob, and uh, the God that Jacob is serving, who made a covenant with, his, uh, with Abraham and Isaac and has made a covenant with him. That's not the God, because God loves you so much that he's committed to you, we know in the New Testament, to make you into the image of Christ. Number three, not only does he let you go through the consequences of your sin lifelong, not only does he, does he take you, um, doesn't soften those consequences of sin, God many times will take you through the school of hard knocks through trials. I want you to see, I want you to think about this. You, you look at the past tonight, it's, it's, it's a story and it's a drama of, of, of God testing and training Jacob. And, and first, there are three things that are ironic in this passage. I want you to think about this. First, do you remember the promise was given to Rebekah that says Esau will serve Jacob? Do you remember that? The older will serve the younger. And it's ironic that Esau will not serve Jacob until, until he has served Laban for 20 years. The Lord knew that what Jacob needed. 20 years of hard labor before all this would come about. The Lord knew what kind of character Jacob needed. And even the golden boy of the patriarch house. Yes, he was industrious. He was in intelligent, but he was now going to hard labor for 20 years. Now, the second thing I want you to think about is this. In receiving Leah, Jacob had to learn respect for the rights of the firstborn. See, Jacob wanted to do things his way. He said, this is my plan for my life. I'm going to do things my way. And all of a sudden, you had to realize that in that culture, you just didn't marry off the firstborn before, or the secondborn before the firstborn. So he had to learn, even though it was in a, in a deceptive way, he had to learn the rights of the firstborn. It's the same thing he did with Esau. He had to conspire to usurp the rights of the, his firstborn brother. And now he wakes up and he's with the wrong woman. And he's enraged. What, is it? what does he say to Laban? What does he say? Does he say, oh, well, I guess I messed up. No, he asks Laban, well, what, what have you done? What does he say here? Um, Why did you deceive me? I mean, he's mad because he was deceived. And, and so, remember, the chickens are coming home to roost. 
He deceived, now he's being deceived, and he's experienced exactly what he did to his brother Esau. But God's still blessing him. God still loves him. Now, I'm not excusing what Laban did here. What Laban did was wrong and deceiving. But it's interesting that God is going to make him taste the exact, exact corresponding fruits of his own deception in his own life. And thirdly, I wanted you to think about this. When we're, when we're talking about that God takes you through the schools of hard knocks, through trials, Jacob, having been deceived by Leah's father in exactly the same way that he deceived his own father, Remember, remember the scene? He goes into Isaac's tents, disguised as his firstborn in Esau. And then seven years later, Leah goes into Jacob's tent, disguised as Rachel. He thinks he's getting the secondborn and he gets the firstborn. He's duped by the disguise of his father-in-law, even as he duped his father by a disguise. So there is a trial that's going on. There is a training that's going on. There is a parenting lesson that is going on here. That, that he's, he's going to be living, and, and think about this. He's going to be living with two wives for the rest of his life. Now, how do I say this? One wife really loves him. She's willing to do just about anything. The one that he really loves, God doesn't seem to bless with children, at least right now. Leah, Leah it says here, it says in verse 31, it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, what happened? God opened up her womb. And she had four sons. He had Reuben. The Lord sees. She says, the Lord saw my affliction. And it, listen to this. Leah and Rachel did not grow up in a godly household. But she had the Lord in her mind, in her heart. And she named her sons after what God was doing in her life. And she says, the Lord sees. She, he sees my affliction First son named Reuben. And there's Simeon. And that's a word similar to Shamar or in reference to prayer. And she said, the Lord has heard me. I've been praying for the Lord to cause my husband to love me. And so she names him Simeon. And then, then she has Levi. Levi. And so, which sounds like the word for attachment. And she, she longs for her husband to gain closer to her. So she names Levi and finally Judah because she praises the Lord. All three or four sons are part of the patriarch family. God has blessed Leah. God has heard her cry. And then alongside Leah, we have Rachel. And in verse 31, he says, but Rachel was barren. See, see, God is always just in what he does. God is just. God's going to bring about, and he blesses even as he disciplines. Let me just, you know the friend of mine who had four cars? We like to cushion us from trials. We, we, don't, we don't like to go through trials. We don't go out on Monday morning and go, man, what disaster can I get myself into today? Is that, is that your mindset? No, that, that's normally not our mindset. We, we, we tend to want, it, it's, like, it's, like the, um, it's like the soldier. Soldiers do not go out every day and go, well, I hope I only get shot four times. No, you go out going, I don't want to be shot at all. And, and we live our lives to, to conceal us or to cocoon us from all the, the drama and the problems and everything on the outside. We have insurance for everything in the world so we can protect ourselves from the trials and everything of life. But you can't protect yourself from everything. You just can't do it. And sometimes the consequences 
of our rebellion and sin are, are, are what we need that we would love God more, depend on God more. Because when you depend on God, when you depend on God more and more and more, it means that God is making himself bigger and bigger and bigger. God doesn't get bigger. But God, but God becomes bigger for you. And God needed to become bigger for Jacob. Because if God's not big enough to handle your problems, your trials, guess what you're going to do? You're going to deceive. You're going to try to get your way. You're going to try to do everything possible to make sure that you don't suffer the consequences of your own actions. But God is bigger than that. God works out circumstances in your life so that you experience those consequences, but at the same time you're experiencing those consequences, God blesses you. At the same time, Jacob was experiencing the consequences of his deception by another person who was deceiving him. He also received the blessings of God being the father of the patriarchs. God was working and blessing Jacob even as Jacob was going through trials and he probably didn't realize that he had blessing. You know, I, I said today we sang, have faith in God. Listen to these words again. I, I was singing them and I was thinking about these words. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all, uh, all the way you've trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches over his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Think about that chorus. Um, when it says, he cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. When you're being disciplined by God, he's going to prevail. But he's also going to bless because he wants you to have dependence and faith in him. And so this whole story of Jacob, this whole idea of Jacob getting away with deception, getting away with his ideas and, and, and not being accountable for his life. No, God makes him accountable. God brings upon him a lesson to be learned. I had a friend of mine that said, it's always better to do what is right in God's eyes than to try to make your life better apart from God. Let me repeat that again. It's always best to do what is right in God's eyes than to make your life more comfortable apart from God. See, if you do what is right in God's eyes, it may, it may cost you. It may cost you. It may not be easy. But there's the easy way to learn our dependence on God and there's the hard way. I really don't want to be disciplined by God. I, I, I'd rather learn it the easy way, you know? I'd rather get it. But we all are disciplined. And the reason why we're disciplined is because God loves. He loves you. And he loves you so much that he does discipline you. And so tonight as we sing a song of invitation... Shouldn't you think about that? These are, these are parenting things. God is parenting us. He's, he's allowing us to experience the consequences of our sins that may affect us for a lifetime. He doesn't give us a soft landing. He, he, he works in our lives and, and he, um, he works in our lives in many different ways. And he takes us through trials and he takes us through difficulties because you know why he does that? He says, really, I want you to depend on me. I want you to depend on me for everything. Not just some things, not just the things that are easy to depend on me, but I, depend on me for every single moment of your life. I want you, everybody to do this. Put your hand over your heart. <clears throat> do you feel your heart beating? 
Do you feel your heart beating? Faintly. Oh, no? Okay. Okay, I feel it somewhere. Every beat is given to you by the grace and mercy of God. So as you think tonight, let's thank him for that. Because the more, the more we, we don't do things God's way, the more we'll go through these schools of hard knocks, just like Jacob did. But we have to learn to depend on God. And God is a loving, caring father to us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you tonight that 